Good evening, Kingdom citizens, or maybe good morning, based on where you are. We welcome you once again to our Bible study, and again, we want to say to those of you I have not had an opportunity to say this to, Happy New Year's. Let's pray together. And dear Lord, we are grateful for this day that you've given to us. We acknowledge you as being the all-wise, the all-knowing, the all-powerful God, the immutable one, the one that we depend upon every day. Thank you that you are sovereign, that you do all things well, and your work in our lives is a finished work. The past, the present, and the future are all one in your eyes. Thank you for your grace and for your mercy. Now, as you have blessed us, help us to bless others. In the name of Jesus, amen. Um, we are now deep into January uh, 2023, and we pray God's richest blessings upon you and your family. We pray that each of you uh, is making progress in whatever goals uh, you have set for this year. Uh, in the old days, we would call them resolutions, um, but many people today call them goals. Um, what are their spiritual goals for the year? What are their financial goals for the year? What are the uh, physical goals for the year? What are the educational or academic goals for the year? So I, I, I encourage you, if you made these around the end of December, that it's time now for some review both of what you've written down, but also of where you are as far as progress. Um, there's a study, there was a study done that says that most New Year's resolutions are broken by the second week in January. For us as Christians, I don't think that resolutions are as important as goals might be, um, that we, we, we have prayed over, uh, that we've sat before the Lord and that we're working through in our lives. So I want to encourage that in your heart and in your life and in your home. In fact, there are some, there can be some family goals. You may have a family goal of taking a vacation together this year some, someplace and making those preparations. Don't wait till the last minute then and decide that uh, you have to put everything on the credit card. Uh, pay as you go as much as possible. A theme for the year Kingdom citizens preparing uh, mind, body, and spirit for post-pandemic pandemic living. Preparing ourselves for post-pandemic living. And I ho certainly hope that that's what you're doing in your own heart and life. There is some preparation. There is some planning. There is some follow-through. The January emphasis continues to be kingdom citizens Cultivating a renewed focus for the new year. A renewed focus. If you're like me, um, some of the goals I had for last year, I didn't do quite as well as I had hoped. Uh, I, I struggled along the way. I got discouraged along the way. But I have renewed some things for 2023. Uh, if I can just encourage you, don't, don't give up. Um, the, the great thing about a new year is an opportunity to begin again. Our words and phrases this month are spiritual focus, humility, empowerment, and pressing on. Lesson four, embracing a new way of thinking. My brothers and my sisters, you tell me some, some things about the way you think, and I can tell you where you are headed. You cannot be a negative thinker and be headed in a positive direction. It's just not possible. We are not guided by our physical actions as much as we are guided by our mental actions, what we believe, what we, what we think, and, and especially what we think about ourselves and those who are closest to us. Our launching questions are, um, how receptive are you to receiving uh, new ideas from others? How receptive are you to receiving new ideas from others? There are some people that refuse to receive or accept ideas that they don't come up with themselves. 
That's a very, very unwise way to live. No one person uh, has all of the best ideas. No one person has all the answers. No one person can do it all by himself or herself. Um, I, am, I would like to say most of the time I'm very open to new ideas. I got to admit there are sometimes I'm not as open as I probably should be, but I am open most of the time. And I want to encourage you to be open to new ideas from others. And, and again, I've learned that God can bless you, encourage you, and challenge you through anybody he wants to. It doesn't have to be through your favorite preacher, your favorite teacher, your prayer partner, or your best friend. It doesn't have to be through one of those people. God can use a child to speak to you. Number two, do you think you can be earthly and spiritual, earthly and spiritual at the same time? And the answer is no. You can't be earthly minded and spiritual at the same time. Um, the Bible tells us in Philippians to let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Paul really gives us a good picture of this in Galatians 5 when he talks about the fruit of the spirit, because he talks about the fruit of the flesh first, and then he talks about the fruit of the spirit. The fruit of the flesh is thinking and acting earthly, and the fruit of the spirit is thinking and acting spiritually. The, the, the sad part about question number two is that there are many people in the church, even many professing Christians, who are more earthly minded than they are heavenly minded. Number three, do you seek to find scripture that address your personal situations or your personal, yeah, your personal situation. I, I, I'm not sure all that question is asking, but I do know this. There are people, I met people who have looked for scripture to support their sinful behavior or their wrongdoing, uh, at least give them some kind of solace or peace about what they are doing. Um, we need to be looking for scripture that will help us obey God and do what he says for us to do, not scripture that's going to support our point of view. And, and oftentimes, uh, and, and, and in theological circles, that's called a proof text when we find a scripture to support what we think versus understanding that scripture in its historical, geographical, uh, and biblical context. And so that's, that's important. Um, we shouldn't just be looking for scriptures. We should be looking for God in the scripture. In fact, every passage of scripture that we read, we ought, we, ought to look, we ought to ask some questions. One of the questions should be, what does this scripture teach me about God? And what does it teach me about myself? Our scripture text today is a very rich one. It comes to us from the book of Ephesians, which is a very, very powerful, uh, it's a great book. Um, uh, Ephesians has often been divided or has been laid out or outlined as being divided into two parts. P primarily, chapters 1 through 3 talks about who we are in Christ Jesus, which means it has to do a lot with what we believe. Chapters 4 through 6 primarily talks about our behavior. The first three chapters are our beliefs. The second three chapters are our behavior. How are we supposed to, what we, who we are and what we are called to do and say we believe in chapters 1, 2, and 3 are to be fleshed out in chapters 4, 5, and 6 and say, how do we live this out now? And so Paul begins to talk about some very, very practical things. And the, the section of Philipp, uh, Ephesians that we're in today then talks about behavior. It talks about some things that we need to do and some things that we shouldn't do. Um, the, the verses in our text begin at verse uh, number 20, but I'm going to begin at verse number 17 because number 20 is in the middle of a thought. 
So, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of your thinking. I think King James Version said, in the futility of your minds. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensualities so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. When we get to verse 20, is a transition word there. That, however, is not the way of life you, were, you have learned or you have been taught. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off the old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self. One is to put off, verse 22, verse 24 says, you are to put on, you are to put on, uh, and put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. The King James Version says, down on your wrath. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Share with those in need. Verse number 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk King James Version says, and I'm reading from NIV, King James Version says, and let no unwholesome word uh, come out of your mouth, but only that which is helpful to building others up according to their need, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. But rid yourselves uh, of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Verse 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ forgave you. Just as Christ in God has forgiven you. Um, again, we're talking about behavior here. Here. The heart of the lesson says, the thoughts of kingdom citizens must be guided toward a lifestyle that is reconciled with God, which then presupposes that you have been reconciled with God. You and I are not going to be able to think a certain way or do certain things if we have not yet been reconciled to God. In our last lesson, we learned the importance of embracing spiritual empowerment in all of our daily living. We learned that God has empowered us to be spirit-driven. This spiritual empowerment gives clarity um, to right behavior and guides us into a right relationship with God and with fellow brothers and sisters. I want to deal with that in just a minute. Continuing with the monthly theme of cultivating a renewed focus, um, in this lesson, we learn how spiritual empowerment enables us to be reconciled to God 
in everything we do. When our spiritual mentality is sharpened, we are led into a new way of thinking. It provides just what we need for this new year. Paul provides guidance in this fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians. So, the Christian life is really made up of two components. One, our relationship with God, and two, our relationship with other men, women, boys, and girls, with our other brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, as kingdom citizens, our lifestyle has to be guided by being reconciled to God. And it is guided by being reconciled to one another. One of the biggest problems in families is a lack of reconciliation. One of the biggest problems in uh, the workplace is division. There is no, people don't want to reconcile with one another. And the biggest, one of the biggest problems in the church is a lack of reconciliation among brothers and sisters in Christ. There are people in the church that do not and some even refuse to get right with a brother or sister. I will not sit down with you. I will not talk to you. I don't care. I don't like you and what you did. I will never forgive you for that. That's the wrong attitude. That's the wrong attitude. You and I cannot be reconciled to God if we're not willing to be reconciled to our brothers and our sisters. I hear somebody saying, Pastor Brock, but that's hard. I, I want to say to you, you're right. It is not easy to always get things right with brothers and sisters. But we can never have the level of productive relationships that we need to have with God or with people until we're willing to get right with our brothers and sisters. We've got to be, we have to humble ourselves. We've got to be willing to say, brother, I was wrong. Sister, I was wrong. Would you forgive me? Yeah. Uh, and that, that's not a one-way conversation. That's not, when, when there is a, a, something between two people, often there, there, there are issues on both sides of the street. It's interesting, and, and this, is a, this is surely true about men. It's interesting that as men, we tend to talk about a lot of useless stuff. We, we tend to talk about a lot of stuff that has no eternal value. But when it comes to the things that are eternal, we are less likely to talk about them very long. That's one of the reasons I believe that the churches today all have a lot more women than men, because men oftentimes don't want to discuss eternal things with each other and with other women. Uh, one of the things that the scripture will do, it will show us ourselves. Let's continue. Kingdom citizens must abandon their old selves and embrace a new identity created by God in holiness. Uh, I love the word embrace um, because I'm a hugger and I love to embrace family and friends. I love to feel that close to people. And you and I need to embrace what God is saying. We need to begin to say, Lord, I'm, I'm going to do it your way. I, I'm going I'm to put my arms around what you've said, and I'm going to hold on to it very tightly. So I want to encourage you, and I want to challenge you today to embrace um, the new identity that God has created in you. If you are in Christ, the scripture says you are a new creation. Some version says you are a, you are a new creature. Yeah. So we've got to embrace that. What does that look like? You know, uh, on this day, because people get married every day of the week now, but on this day, somebody's getting married someplace. And the individual... Uh, let's just use the man. This man who's, well, both of them, the man and the woman, who are getting married today, what they are doing is they are embracing marriage, which means then both of them 
have to learn how to live as married people. Because if they don't embrace marriage, then that means that he's going to live, he's married, but he's going to live like a single man, or she's married, and she's going to live like a single woman, and the marriage will not work. We must both embrace, the husband and the wife must embrace um, the new relationship. Which leads us to the fact that for you and for me, when we come to Christ, now we must embrace the new relationship. If you are moving to a new country today, even though you know where you're going to move to, you know some things about it, one of the things that needs to be your primary focus is to learn the ways and customs of the place that you're moving to. Because it might be similar to where you live, but it's different. Yeah, and so that, that's important. So you then have to embrace. You might say, well, I don't like chicken cooked this way, or I don't like uh, the way they, 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 they make their rice. I don't like the way they do these things. Well, you have to figure out how do I learn to embrace some of the cultural things of this particular community. And I want to tell you, one of the great challenges for us as Christians is some of us have never learned to embrace the things of the kingdom of God. Let's look at um, the commentary. Paul encouraged the Ephesians to take on a new identity. Have you, my brothers and my sisters, taken on a new identity? Jesus called it a born-again experience. This can only be done with the right understanding of the truth of Jesus Christ. He clarifies that even though they have heard some things about Christ, they must seek greater truth. This is a lesson uh, for us today because many people have heard about Christ and do not seek the greater truth about God, about who God is. Many confess or many are confused because they have become comfortable with limited knowledge. Paul makes it clear. That however, it, uh, however, it is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. Or that, however, is. We must embrace the new identity in Jesus Christ. I'm sorry. We must embrace our new identity in Jesus Christ. We must take off the former way of life. Paul is painfully aware of his shortcomings, mistakes, areas of growth, and his sin. He has not achieved complete conformity to the image of Christ, nor has he obtained perfect knowledge of Christ. Neither have you, and neither have I. Neither has you, or neither have I. Or neither has I. Um, we have not. We have not obtained that. Even though we have knowledge of the resurrection, we have not grown into the full power of the resurrection. Boy, that's a, that's that's a whole nother lesson within itself. Paul tells them, be uh, made new in the attitude of your mind. It means that we put off, uh, that we put on the new self, created to be like God, um, in true righteousness and holiness. Let me simply ask you this, my brothers and my sisters. Are you pursuing righteousness and holiness in the way you are living each day? Let that one sink in. Are you pursuing? I'm not asking you if you prayed this morning. I'm not asking you if you read the scripture this morning. I'm not asking you if you, 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 you um, uh, helped your neighbor this morning. I'm asking you, are you pursuing righteousness and holiness in the fear of God? It is, it is a difficult process, but it is possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
One of the things that we don't, we don't do well, or many of us, some of us, is that we are not uh, in, in allowing the Holy Spirit to empower us to do what God said for us to do. You know, the way we respond to something says a lot about us. In fact, sometimes it says a lot more about us than it does about the person who said it to us. And I know I'm, I'm human just like you. If you cut me, I'm going to bleed. Uh, and, if you, and if you insult me, it's going to hurt me. But you and I need to learn how to respond in a proper way. So again, we're dealing here with behavior. It's the way we act. Not when things are going well, just, not just when things are going well, but when things are going bad or very badly. How do, how do we act or react? Do we react or act in the way that the world does? Or we, do we act or react in the way that a believer who has now taken on a new identity and who is a new creation in Christ um, does? Number two, our new identities will help transform our, our old negative thoughts into positive behavior. I love that statement. I love that statement. Be because of our new identity, it's going to help us transform, change our old negative thoughts into new positive behavior. Your behavior, your behavior, my behavior is not going to change until our thoughts, our thinking changes. I don't care what anyone says. I don't care what anyone says. That's why we, we've often said to young people, you got to be careful what kind of music you listen to. And I had a, a, a young person tell me one time, well, I, I don't really listen to the words. I listen to the beat. And, I'm, and, I, and I told her, you do whether you think you are listening to those words or not, if I ask you about that song, you could repeat those words right now. You see, you and I are being influenced in ways and by things sometimes we don't even recognize. Um, uh, case in point, and I wish I was a musician right now. Case in point, if someone in here was playing on the organ or the piano or the keyboard, I dare say that most of us will begin to either hum or tap our feet where we are. You know why? Because the music is impacting us. It's impacting us. In fact, we might, we might not even know the song. This new life is not achieved through passivity, but activity. Boy, that's good. We don't, we don't get new life through activity, but we are to achieve those things that God is calling us to through activity. Love is a very powerful verb. And it's an active verb. It's not a passive verb. Um, some Christians, some people who say they are Christians have never grown. And that's, that's a bad thing. I have a friend whose granddaughter was born with several mental defects uh, last year. And she's not progressing um, mentally as she should. She's not able to do some things that, uh, that an eight month old should be able to do mentally oh, because it shows up in her cognitive or lack of cognitive development. She's not able to do some of the things physically that an eight-month-old should be able to do. And I dare say that's some of us as Christians. We're not doing some of the things that we should be doing, the activities we should be able to, to do. At, you've been a Christian for three years now. That's your testimony. But you're still not able to do some of the things that are very basic in the Christian life. You're not having a daily, daily devotional time. And, what, and, and you say, but Pastor Buck, I don't know how to have a daily devotional time. Come to me. Come to one of your leaders. Come to one of your pastors. We'll, we will help you develop a daily devotional time. Show you a pattern that you can expand on over time. Just like a natural child should develop and grow naturally. They call them benchmarks. 
The doctors call them benchmarks. The healthcare system call them benchmarks. Children ought to hit certain markers or benchmarks to show health. Christians need to be hitting some serious benchmarks to show spiritual health. So, the right here says, Scripture, uh, uh, we should ask ourselves, why are we behaving the way that we are behaving? If you're still behaving the way you've always behaved, why are you still doing that? We should find Scripture that relates to our circumstances or the circumstances that we are facing. Renewing our mind is at the center of our transformation. You and I will never be transformed without the word of God. I don't care if you listen to it. I don't care if you read it. Or whatever, whatever format you take, you need to either listen to it, you need to read it, you need to study it, meditate on it, memorize it. Without the word of God and a strong diet of the word of God, you are not going to be able to, be, you will not be transformed. You will never be changed. I found people who are jealous of other Christians who are growing. I've seen it. I've been in church many years now. I've been in pastoral ministry for many years now, many decades. And I've, 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 all, I've seen people over the years be angry with other people who are growing faster than they are. The question is, what are you doing? What are you doing to grow in the Christian life? You may have heard me say this before. I, I heard a commentator say recently about Tom Brady. He said, someone said, how can Tom Brady as a 45 year old or a 46 year old be able to still be playing in the NFL? It's never been done before. And the commentator said two things. He says, Tom Brady has a strong diet that he sticks with and a, reg a physical regimen that he sticks with every day. You can't change. You can't get stronger in the Christian life if you don't have a strong diet that you're going to stick to when it comes to the word of God. So the author says, yeah, therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor for we are members of the same body. Why do you say you're a Christian but you're lying to people? I mean, not just once or twice. You just keep lying to people. And why are we lying at all? We are the people of God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If Jesus is truth, then you and I ought to be speaking truth. Yeah. So we, we need to stop lying to one another. But we ought to speak truthfully to one another. We ought to speak honestly with one another. He says, uh, do not act on your, your, your negative emotions. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't let it go down on your anger. Some people wake up in the morning anger and they go angry and they go to bed at night angry. Don't let it happen to you. We need to channel negative thoughts into positive behavior. And that's, that's a really good point because... One way to change something negative in your life is to do something positive. In fact, if you are struggling with, with wrong thoughts, evil thoughts, ungodly thoughts, what you need to do is to start focusing on something that is positive, that is biblical. One of the great things is scripture memory, and you can begin to, when your mind has been bombarded by certain things, you can begin to quote scripture. In fact, that's, that's one of the things I did this morning. I, quoted, I started quoting scripture. Uh, one of my favorite passages uh, is Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sin, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth fruit in his season. His leaves also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so. But are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So this helps to rechannel, redirect my thoughts um, when, when they're going wrong. 
Anyone, and th this is great. I mean, this is simple, but it's great. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer. That's part of your old life, what you used to do. Many of us stole. I've stolen something, but that's not what I do now because I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus, but must work. There is the antidote to stealing. It's getting a job. It's amazing to me that we live in a culture today where many people are trying to steal what other people are working for. That's a shame and a disgrace. Do something useful with their hands that they may have something to give. Now, now this is real conversion here. This is real conversion here where you go from stealing to giving. That's a changed life. Let me, I want to show you an illustration that um, I've used many times before. I actually absolutely love it uh, because I think that we all need a changed life. Um, so all of you are familiar with, with this item. This is corn, corn on the cob. Okay? Now, so when the seed was planted, a, a corn seed was planted, and, and corn came as a result of that. But through a process of transformation, this corn has become meal. Okay? It's been changed. It's not, it is, it came from corn, thank you, Jesus. But it's not corn anymore. It's now corn meal. What I'm saying to you, my brothers and sisters, this represents who we were. This represents who we are. And the one thing I love about this illustration, and I want to say to someone who thinks they can lose their salvation, you can't lose it because you've been changed. You've been converted to something different. This cornmeal can never become corn again. And that's what happens when Jesus Christ comes into our lives. He changes us from who we were to who we are. Where we used to steal, now we work with our hands so that we can give to those who are in need. Finally, just a thought. Our new identities, number three, will transform our old ways of speaking, leading us to talk right. So when your thinking is right, then you begin to live right, then you begin to talk right. Now, I hear, I hear one brother out there saying, I hear my spirit, the brother is saying, well, but I still have bad thoughts. And yes, you're going to still have sinful thoughts. We're never going to be complete um, in this life. We're never going to be sinless in this life, but we can sin less, okay? And one day when we get to heaven, in fact, one day when we get to heaven, even this is going to be changed again because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, our body is going to be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. So as I close today, our new empowerment should not only change the way we behave, it also should change the way we communicate with others. Do not let any unwholesome word come out of your mouth but only what is helpful for building others up according to their need that it may that they may benefit that it may benefit the listener as kingdom citizens we need to learn to talk right we need to learn to talk right may i challenge you this week to look at your thinking to look at your behavior and to look at what you're saying and ask God to help you in all three areas. The Spirit of God is there to help you. The Word of God is there to help you each and every day. Shall we pray together? Dear Lord, thank you so much for this word. Thank you for the Apostle Paul, who was a great man of God and who shared out of the depths of his heart. Thank you, Lord, that Paul believed you and he taught us so many things from your word. God, help this word to go forth and people who will hear it, Lord, who, lives will be touched in a very, very powerful way. Thank you for your grace and your mercy to each one of us now. And help us, Lord, to think right, to act right, and to speak right. In the name of Jesus, amen.